Okay, so our first speaker is Alex Dittrich, who's the senior lecturer in zoology here at the university. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Good. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about the importance of invertebrates. And you're going to hear me um, uh, ranting quite vociferously about the bad press that uh, insects and other invertebrates get, uh, which is something that I spend an awful long time talking to my students about to try and get them enthusiastic. So when we talk about insects, um, one of the things that uh, I find absolutely mind-boggling is the fact that there are so many of them in the world. There's approximately 10 quintillion individuals on this planet, which is just an extraordinary number when you actually think about it. That equates to about 1.23 billion insects per individual human on the planet. That's a lot of invertebrates. That's a lot of insects. Um, of this, 1.37 million animal species that are described only 66,800 species of vertebrates. So we're dealing with what I like to refer to as quite a lot of taxonomic chauvinism in the, in the world. And uh, I spend a lot of my time trying to uh, kind of offset that bias that we see with the invertebrates, okay? So I'm going to be uh, talking a lot about this and talking about some of the some of the reasons for this in the press, and some of the things that we do as entomologists, as invertebrate ecologists, to try and offset this. So, when we talk about species diversity, 74% are actually insects. 74% are insects and other invertebrates, rather. Um, in the UK, this figure is about 70%. So this is of all species. We think about fish, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, these other animals. They take up uh, what is a pretty small proportion of that pie, actually, to be honest. Um, uh, I don't like to use the term, but um, for all intents and purposes, uh, a lot of those other animals are quite inconsequential, right? <laughs> the, uh, the insects and invertebrates are the most important things on this planet, whether you like it or not. Um, and if we kind of visualise that, you have something that looks like this, which is uh, quite a terrifying diagram, really, in all, uh, in all fairness. See that lovely little chunk there? That, this is biomass, right? That's the biomass of arthropods on the planet, right? See that there? That's humans. So small, you know? So 42% of animal biomass or a billion tonnes of carbon is made up of all the arthropods on this planet. Annelids and mollusks making up the rest of this big chunk here. Uh, an interesting little one down here are the nematodes. 57 billion nematodes per person. So there's even more nematodes per person than there are um, uh, insects. And one of my favourite little quotes is, if we were to all sort of disappear in some sort of weirdly surreal science fiction experiment, there would be these lovely little halos of nematodes where we're, um, uh, where we're left where the people had gone. We're literally just teeming with them. So yes, nematodes are everywhere. Arthropods, analysts, mollusks. This is where it's at when it comes to biodiversity. And don't forget the fish. Um, right. So I've uh, ranted quite vociferously about the fact that there are quite a lot of invertebrates on this planet. Uh, but what do they do? Um, uh, I think it's probably uh, better to say what they don't do, actually, is, is probably, probably easier to explain. So they basically do everything, okay? They look after our food security, they take care of weed and pest control, they're food for other animals. Pollination, as you know, is a really, really important role. Nutrient cycling, detrictivity, all these things are hugely important, okay? If we didn't have invertebrates, if we didn't have insects on the planet, the entire ecosystem would collapse. The biosphere that we live in would just not exist. Okay? They're hugely, hugely important. Okay? But we're all friends in this room right now. We've come here to an invertebrate event, so um, I would like to think that I am preaching to the choir, as it were. But anyway... 
So when we talk about the roles of these invertebrates, do we think about pollination? When people think about pollination, you think about lovely little bees flying around, pollinating flowers. But something that you may not be aware is it's not really just bees that do this pollination. In fact, if you think about the percentages of species per taxa, the most important pollinators that we have out there are actually the flies, the diptera, the hymenoptera of which a proportion of bees come in a close second with about 20% within that taxa, um, fulfilling pollination roles. But basically, yes, all insects pollinate to some degree, or at least there are members of those orders that have pollination roles. And I think it's important to sort of check in on ourselves when we're thinking about these things that we don't just immediately think to honeybees. You know, there are other... There are other insects out there that we can think about. Big up the flies, we love them. Um, when we talk about pest control, you know, it's very, very easy to think about um, ladybirds. Talking about ladybirds earlier, we, you know, very popular beetle, loved by many people. Um, but it's not just the ladybirds that take care of these roles. We've got parasitic hymenoptera. We've got loads of other things, including this. This is one of my favourite insects. Um, put your hand up if you know what this is. I'm not going to ask for a... OK, like only a few people okay, know what this is. This is a Strepsiptera. This is one of my absolutely favourite insects. This is an insect that you never see because um, the female is basically a bag of eggs that lives within the abdomen of other insects and the male is this quite showy little chap here. They are an obligate parasite of a range of different insects and they uh, kind of emerge from this cavity within the abdomen of the insects. So this is a strepsiptera. These are important for regulating populations of other pest insects. So this regulating role is actually fulfilled in numerous different ways by loads and loads of different taxa out there. But it's all very easy to kind of think, oh, ladybirds, yeah. But there's other things doing it too, okay? So think a bit, a bit broader. And when we think about uh, decomposition, another one of the key roles that invertebrates do, uh, there's flies, there's beetles, there's all sorts of things out there that are, that are taking care of that. And if we lost these, that role would just be fulfilled with bacteria and other decomposers, okay? If it wasn't for the insects, the world would be rife with disease, okay? They're hugely important for maintaining a healthy planet for us. So, that's me going on about how important insects are. They're hugely important, but why should we be worried? There's 10 quintillion of these things, you know, well over a million described species, potentially loads more to discover. But why should we be worried? The statistics are really damning. That's why we should be worried, OK? Um, Recent-ish paper by Sanchez Bayo and a surname that I'm not going to try and pronounce in 2019, looked at 41% of insect species declining globally, OK? and a third of those being endangered. So we're looking at 41% of insect taxa out there are declining globally. That is a damning statistic if ever I read one. Okay, so we can see in the UK, we're looking at a median average of 70%. So we're, we're above that global average. Things are looking really, really quite serious in the UK in terms of insect declines. And we need to really do something about this. Otherwise, you know, things are going to go to pot, to put things bluntly. Now, um, I stepped in for Matt Shardlow, who um, sadly is uh, unwell, so unable to deliver this talk. So I have to talk about bug life and the wonderful things that bug life are doing. And one of their most recent reports is from this Bugs Matter campaign, which you should be aware of, which looks at... Uh, it's a citizen science project that looks at bugs splatted on car number plates. Okay? It's a wonderful little project by which you can take a photo of your car number plate and uh, it 
does a count of the numbers of insects that spattered on your number plate. And they looked at data, historical data from 2004, comparing that to data that are collected from 2022, and they came up with this horrible number of 64%. That's 64% of flying insects in the UK declining between 2004 and 2022. Um, that is a really, really, really horrible statistic. 64% in a very, very short space of time. I don't really want to look at those projections for the next 10 years. We do need to do something about this, okay? Uh, but again, you know, let's be positive. There's a lot of people in this room right now that are here because of insects and invertebrates, so maybe we can do something collectively together. I'm hoping so. Uh, well, anyway, why are they suffering? There's a number of reasons why they're suffering. Urbanisation. There's lack of habitat out there for insects. There's a loss of land. Agricultural practices. The list goes on. There's an enormous list of uh, problems as to why these insects and other invertebrates are suffering. Okay. If we look again at bug life's data, you can have a look at one of the issues here. This looks at rivers. You can see neonicotinoid pesticides within rivers. 74% of rivers in the UK contaminated with neonics, okay? with several of those, as you can see, exceeding acute levels that are causing the... Uh, at least that's slightly less annoying now. Um, that are levels that are you know, causing severe uh, collapse in the food webs within those in those rivers. We're dealing with some really, really serious agricultural contamination in some of our rivers nationally. So, in spite of these threats to the insects, in spite of all these horrible things that are going on, most conservation efforts, unfortunately, are geared towards wonderful, large, charismatic species. There's not a lot out there that deals specifically with insect and invertebrate conservation. Okay? You may think that's not the case for all you wonderful people in this room, but in fact, the sad case is they are often left behind. Here we have bison that's being introduced in various parts of the country for their wonderful role in terms of conservation grazing. Um, but it costs a lot of money. The Eurasian beaver, another thing that's been uh, introduced up and down the country. Uh, the Scottish beaver reintroduction recently, just the administrative costs, the pre-feasibility administrative costs to get these things in the water up there cost over £2 million. Pounds, right? £2 million quid. You could do quite a lot for insects with that £2 million quid. But I'm going to move on. Um, and I'm going to just talk about why we have some of those biases. Now, uh, Simon Leather, the late great Simon Leather, wrote about taxonomic chauvinism, this thing that I introduced at the start in 2009. It's an old paper, but it still holds true. And he looked at um, papers in biological conservation. Over 15 years, 69% of papers in biological conservation were vertebrates. Okay, 69% of that work on biological conservation was geared towards the vertebrates, 11% on insects. But if you think about that in terms of the biodiversity, you've got 79% of these animals are, uh, are insects, with that 3% remaining being vertebrates. So in spite 3% of that global diversity making up the vertebrates, they're getting 69% of the attention. Okay? So that is... Slightly problematic to my ears. But why are they getting that attention? You may ask. Um, I'm going to just jump straight to the press. The lovely press. Um, and we've got, you know, reputable news outlets such as the Daily Star. Um, <laughs> putting things like, uh, 10 million killer spiders are on the loose in Britain. This is what they look like. The lovely Steatoda novelist. Beautiful little thing. Um, you know, if you were to believe anything, the, the Daily Star says they're out there to kill your grandparents. They're really not, okay? They've been established in the UK for quite some time. Um, yes, there are some issues 
but that's for another conversation. Lovely article here in the Metro from a few years ago on ladybirds. An STD-ridden ladybird species is back and threatening to invade the UK all over again. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I do have a degree in biology. Um, uh, STDs are spread in a very specific way. And um, I, uh, I don't think we need to worry about ladybirds. Uh, in fact, this uh, particular article relates to a uh, fungicidally... It's, it's a, a fungus um, that is spread via sexual interactions between Harmonia axiridis, which is an invasive species of ladybird. So, in fact, this is probably quite a good pathogen because it's helping regulate those non-native species that are threatening our native species. But the metro managed to spin it, didn't they? <laughs> Another one here, bed bugs, how to defend your home against bed bug invasions amid fear of possible influx from France. Okay, the mail online, yeah, classic. Um, yes, another, another thing that we're told to, to worry about. And this is, this is one that I picked up yesterday as well, I love this, uh, on the Daily Express. Pest expert issues poisonous spider warning as weather drives them inside homes. Now... If you know anything about animal biology, you don't need to worry about poisonous anything unless you're eating it, okay? Um, and if my cat is anything to go by and the numbers of spiders that she ingests, I don't think we really need to worry. Um, so yes, uh, don't trust the express. Anyway, um, moving on. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here. Uh, I published this paper with some colleagues on uh, allometry. So we were looking at a big meta-study of, of insects and, and other taxa to basically look at how their growth affected their ability to climb up walls in simple terms. But this is a, a, a paper that drummed up quite a lot of attention with the press. And this is a, a quote from me in the BBC. Uh, this is back when I was a PhD student. Uh, I wrote... Different animals have come up with remarkably similar adaptations to deal with the problem of climbing vertical surfaces. However, it appears there are limitations on those using sticky foot pads. Spider-Man may need to rethink his methods. Okay? You know, making it current, making it kitsch. Uh, yeah, but when the mail online gets hold of it, <laughs> things get slightly... Uh... So how much time, money and energy have they spent? Uh, considering something that's impossible. Yes, we weren't doing the work to try and disprove Spider-Man <laughs> sitting from crew. Um, you know that Spider-Man's not real. Yes, Stevie Boy. I like this one, though. You know that Spider-Man is hyphenated, don't you? Yeah, that was quite good. Um, but also, we got, a, we got on the Colbert Report, if you've ever seen that. Stephen Colbert did a little song about this paper, um, about science ruining Spider-Man. Um, so, yeah, it drummed up a little bit of attention. Um, I, you know, maybe we angered a few children because we killed Spider-Man, but, you know, nonetheless, am I part of the problem? Anyway. Now, taxonomic chauvinism, it, uh, it perpetuates not only how we deal with um, conservation issues, it's also a, a problem when it comes to records. Now, if anyone is familiar with the GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, uh, there's an interesting trend when you compare the numbers of records of birds versus the numbers of records of insects. Okay, this is quite interesting. So if, uh, in this graph, the number of records that you're expecting for a taxa, right, was proportional to the diversity of those animals globally, right, you would sit right in the middle of that line there, okay? So if we look at the reptiles, they sit just over the line, so the numbers of records, biodiversity records for reptiles, are largely proportional to the diversity of reptiles that we have, so the numbers of records are, are true and expected. Make sense? All right? Yeah? I'm not talking nonsense here. I need to check in. I'm a lecturer, you know. Yeah, right, okay. Um, the apes, the birds, right, 500 million odd more records than you would expect relative to their diversity. That's quite a lot, isn't it, really? Um, if we look at the insects, 
you got a shortfall of over 200 million records. So they're massively under-recorded globally. And this trend is continuing. Um, it's, in fact, it's going up from 1956 to 2005 there. You can see this little dot plot that kind of shows that relationship. So there we go, you know. Under-recording, under-representation, under-funding. Lovely press doing wonderful things to, to sell these animals. But there's a little bit of chauvinism within the insects. Um, you know, I like butterflies. Butterflies are nice, but they're also kind of overrepresented within the uh, within the insects. I had a conversation with a couple of people about certain insect biases. Um, so in Europe, only 12.12 percent of insect species are protected by law. Really low number. Um, and a lot of this is, is very much down to uh, well-knownness and taxonomic bias. So if you have a look here, um, uh, the beetles and the Lepidoptera, in particular the butterflies, um, show many more protected species than other taxa would. And this paper, this study, looked at certain characteristics, certain traits that people kind of lean to that kind of influence this protectedness. Colourful features, nice big flappy wings, that kind of thing. You know, there aren't that many uh, protected strepsipterines out there because, you know, people think alien. Ooh. Right. Um, but anyway, yeah, what can we do? Um, there are a few strategies that we can deal, uh, that can deal with uh, conservation of invertebrates. Basically, species recovered, recovery, habitat scale, conservation, and changing people's public perceptions, changing the perception of the public. And when we talk about species recovery, we can talk about single species recovery. And there's a lot of great case studies of that. At the habitat scale, there's a few things going on. But the public perceptions thing is something that requires a little bit more work. And a shameless plug for my seminar this afternoon, I'm going to be talking quite a lot on point number three. So, uh, yeah, come along to that. Uh, again, mentioning bug life. Bug life are really, really good at getting people together when it comes to species recovery. You're probably familiar, certainly the entomologists in the room, with the recently dis rediscovered Carabus intricatus, which is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, ground beetles in the country. Uh, thought extinct in 1994, recently rediscovered. The uh, organisation Bug Life are spearheading what is a fantastic citizen science recording program so we can kind of understand a little bit more about its ecology. There's also uh, another great project on the narrow-headed ant, which is one of the rarest wood ant species in the UK, which has these really unique little thatch nests in grassland. And they're kind of looking at capturing ants during their nuptial flights, rearing them up, re-releasing them into the wild to establish new nests. And these are projects that, are, that are really seem to be working. Okay, they're working. Um, my own work works on predominantly uh, this taxa here. This is Rabalta delphite imitans. This is one of the rarest insects in the UK that nobody's ever heard of. Okay, it's a lovely little plant hopper that you will find in this area, actually. This is one of the only parts of the country where you're likely to encounter it. Okay. Find it over in Cambridge. I'm not recorded in Nottinghamshire yet, but no doubt I will try and find it. Uh, so I'm going to try and do my little bit to sell this lesser known taxa to you and the audience to try and get you excited. And the first thing that I find really exciting about them is they're the only insect out there that's actually got gears. Okay? They are an insect that has gears, only one, okay, mind. Uh, and this is uh, related to their biology. They are called leaf hoppers and plant hoppers for a reason. They can hop really well, okay? So if we look at Phalaena spermaris, which actually doesn't have gears, but it's a really good hopper, it will um, jump about 70 centimetres off the ground, which is quite impressive when it's like that big. Um, and uh, when it does this, it is subject to gravitational forces of about 100 times normal gravity, which is really extraordinary. You know, if, you, if you're subjected to about... 10 times normal gravity to pass out. So amazing animals. But Isis colopratus is the one that has these gears. Amazing group of animals, the leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, but they are hugely under-recorded in the UK, mostly because people, 
I don't know, just don't like them. They're too small, they're too tricky to identify. Uh, but anyway, yes, um, there are some gaps in that recording effort. And, uh, you know, I think more people should get interested in these small taxa, so these, these less charismatic taxa, so to try and fill some of these gaps in the distribution. So just in some routine surveys, we've had some rare, rare individuals turn up. Generally, every single targeted survey that I'll do for leafhoppers and plant hoppers, I'll find some rare species, some red data book species, um, including a couple that I found recently. Florid Elfax, Paraphasma, notable A, feeding on brown sedge. Um, we've got this one here, Parabolina clypeus, red daisy book species. <coughs> Data not updated from 1992. These were found in my back garden, you know. So, um, yeah, amazing. Yeah, if you go looking for them, you'll find them. But they are very, very interesting. And, um, you know, understanding a little bit about their ecology, because they're quite interesting things to study, you can find a lot about how ecosystems work and they function. And one of the things that I've uh, done recently is looking about how rare species and common species kind of work together to kind of influence communities. I'm not going to talk about this too much because I don't want to bore you, but yeah, I would say uh, we published on this and we found some interesting little things, particularly how these lovely little food webs work. It's just an example showing you a uh, bipartite network. Has anyone ever seen one of these before? It's a pretty diagram to illustrate how your insects there feed on their plants. And each one of these lines that you see going from one to the other is an interaction. And by understanding the autocology, understanding the ecology of these individual species, you can find out how these networks kind of come together. And then you can understand how you can best manage your land for these species. Speaking of an interest managed, uh, an interesting managed habitat, one of the most simple habitats I'm interested in is cattle graze pasture. You see these little things here, these are cattle dung islets. These little islets you always find dotted around cattle pasture because cattle don't like eating around their dung, it's an anti parasite thing. And we found that. 50% of total arthropod diversity, or the percentage of the abundance of these arthropods, rather, is found entirely within these islands. Okay? So in spite of them making up just 24% of the, of the pasture, they're making up this enormous uh, sink for the, for the individuals that are there. So really, really important. So these little things you, know, you can find out by studying these sort of slightly less charismatic species that find in the grassland. Come on, you hoppers. Um, now, when it comes to my third point there, um, kind of influencing public opinions and kind of getting the public on board, a lot of my work is focused on transforming public green space. So in the last project before I left the grey north of uh, Carlisle to come down here to sunny Nottinghamshire, was looking at uh, transforming parkland. And uh, here are a number of different parks where we have lobbied councils to try and get uh, a change in their management strategy to influence the uh, invertebrate fauna that we're finding there. And we did this by encouraging the councils to basically change their mowing regime. Okay. Now, it's not as simple as you may think. You can't just go to a council and say, um, we, need to, we need to fix up your own mowing regime. Don't cut so much grass. Okay? It requires a little bit of buy-in from the public. So we lobbied them, and we got these signs put up, including all the information here, QR codes that tell us why we're doing this, linking to real-time data on surveying, um, and also as well, um, that was my little addition. We are feeding the bees and other insects. Because it's not just about bees. Okay, there are other insects out there as well. And uh, getting the public involved, getting kids involved, is what's really, really important. I'm going to be talking about this uh, at quite a lot of depth this afternoon in my seminar. So that's my shameless plug before I move on to my summary. Insects are in trouble. They're really in trouble. Um, and most of that is down to 
bias, taxonomic chauvinism. Uh, but in spite of this, there's a lot of good things that people are doing out there, and insects are cheap. They respond very well to those positive interventions, so a uh, little can go a long way. Uh, thanks. Any questions, if there's time?